Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Cardiology uh, Grand Rounds on Wednesday mornings. Um, it gives me pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Mel Arnault. She's a member of the uh, Division of Endocrinology. Um, she's the uh, director of the Diabetes Clinic here at the Heart Institute. Um, and uh, she's going to talk to us today about the last decade of uh, the clinic and, and where we've come over that period of time. So welcome, uh, Dr. Arnault. We look forward to your presentation this morning. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Stadnik, and I, I really appreciate being invited um, to, to do this talk. Um, so my title may not be immediately obvious as to why I chose TIN, but it is a play on 10 years is, is in, in an anniversary um, sort of uh, world, is, is the year of the TIN. Um, I thought that was a nice pun to, to 10 years. Um, and I think sweetheart is, is also kind of a, a nice play on diabetes since that is the, the disease of sweetness. Um, so um, hopefully the, the title is, is catchy and, and got your attention. Um, and as uh, mentioned, it, it has been uh, a little over 10 years since I started working at the Heart Institute and, and, and working with many of you and developing, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a incredibly comprehensive program. And, and I thought this would be a good time for us to, to share, you know, where we've come from and, and where we are today. So I have uh, no relevant disclosures for this particular talk. So. You know, if you came in and attended this morning bright and early, hoping to get, you know, um, you know, some new knowledge on diabetes, this is not the talk for you. Um, I've done those before and I'm happy to have, you know, more discussions and questions addressing diabetes topics. But I hope that at the end of this session, the participants will be able to basically appreciate the breadth of the diabetes initiatives that we have offered uh, and continue to offer at the, at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. It really is uh, um, the first of its kind and probably the only one of its kind uh, in the country. Um, we'll talk a little bit about strategies that we've undertaken to optimize diabetes in cardiac patients. Um, and of course, these uh, are evidence-based strategies. And, and I hope that the participants here will offer me and my team, you know, ideas for ongoing program development and collaborative opportunities. Um, at this point, 10 years into, into this um, particular initiative, I'm no longer a guest, I'm officially a squatter. So take advantage of my squatting status and, and, and really share with me where you think that we can improve and, and, and help all of us. So this is in essence this, the, the the key slide. This is all that I, I you know I could think of that we have done over the past decade fit into one schematic. And I am an endocrinologist and I'm a diabetologist, which means that I do view the world in a very diabetes centric way. So diabetes is right in the middle of everything, and and that's how I I prioritize uh, you know my my thinking and my strategy in terms of how I operate from day to day. Um, and what we try to kind of uh, provide at the Heart Institute is really programs that that span the breadth of the different services that that are going on uh, within the institution. Um, so inpatient cardiology, cardiac surgery. There's some hospital-wide um, initiatives that we've undertaken, uh, and we'll go over them. Um, and then the outpatient, you know, segment of it is actually a, a small component. It is the component that I'm directly responsible for, so I will speak to that, which is, the, you know, the the clinic and how we we've operated uh, that clinic to to optimize uh, post discharge patients from the Heart Institute. But really, the program goes beyond that outpatient component, and I really do have to take the time here to to give kudos to the many, many members of the of the of the, the nursing staff and team that really have helped operationalize all of the inpatient aspects of, of this particular program. Um, in particular, I will highlight a few uh, initiatives just to give you a sense of, of what um, you know what the pro process has been like. Um, those are the um, the the processes highlighted or or bolded and and italicized. Um, so we'll go over sort of the hospital wide rollout of the of the diabetes medical directive um, that happened right from the beginning of, of the launch of this particular program. Um, we'll talk a little bit about pre-diabetes, which 
is is kind of an, a, a neat little sub, uh, you know, a study that we did to, to look at prediabetes in cardiac patients. Um, and then we, uh, you know, we've done a lot in 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 in, in both cardiology and cardiac surgery. Um, but I I think it's kind of nice to also kind of um, uh, talk a little bit about prehab, which is a a little tiny program that we did with cardiac surgery patients, um, just again to optimize, you know, what we can offer that population. And then uh, I will talk a little bit about, you know, what we did with the uh, perioperative insulin management that we did in that particular population. And finally, you know, things are changing rapidly in the cardiology and endocrinology world. There is a lot of intersecting in terms of management and, and, uh, and, and therapies that are, are really common to both. And along with sort of, you know, really being advocate advocate for, um, you know, using newer therapies, there, there is a, a definitely potential for harm, potential for adverse effects. And, and part of what um, I've been doing recently is also looking at, you know, a subset of, of, of that particular uh, safety aspect, which is related to uh, DKA. DK risk with uh, the newer therapies, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. And I'll talk a little bit about um, the data we've collected for that. So the background basically started uh, in 2010. Um, and, you know, I, again, you know, this audience knows, you know, the, the, the prevalence and the risk of diabetes in terms of uh, adverse cardiac outcomes. We, uh, for me, you know, uh, as a diabetologist, I know that cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular death is the most common cause of death in, in patients with diabetes. I know that having diabetes confers uh, a greater mortality in patients, uh, you know, at the 30-day and one-year mark from a, from a, a non-STEMI and at a 30-day mark for a STEMI. And studies have consistently shown that, you know, across all cohorts of cardiac patients from outpatient cardiology, inpatient cardiology, cardiac surgery patients, cabbage patients, you know, you have up to about 40% of, of uh, cardiac patients have a diagnosis of diabetes, and that's diagnosed. So there's um, definitely a, a, a larger number of unknown diabetes, depends on, you know, what screening strategies are, are undertaken and what the cutoffs are, um, and prediabetes, which we know confers an additional risk. The challenge is um, that prediabetes has not been, uh, or treating prediabetes has not been proven to, to uh, mitigate that risk or, or change outcomes with respect to, to, to cardiac patients. Um, so th that's where we started from. We knew that this was a, you know, a gap, um, and we know that there is a high risk. We know that there's a large proportion of population, but we know that this is not being system systematically addressed in, uh, in our patients at the Heart Institute back then. And so that led to this particular starting question, which is, is it feasible for primarily cardiology inpatient service to systematically identify and treat diabetes according to current guidelines? And this uh, launched the, uh, the glucose uh, study. Um, and again, I, I have to give credit to, to, to Dr. Rick Davies, who, who was the uh, PI on this, um, along with myself and, and Dr. Janine Malcolm and, and, and um, uh, Brenda Lee, uh, our, our nurse educator at the time. We basically looked at you know, patients who were admitted with type 2 diabetes and acute coronary syndrome uh, admitted to the cardiology ward. And then the, the, um, the next steps were really randomizing these patients to either usual inpatient care, which could be at the discretion of the, of the admitting physician, um, whether they wanted to do something about the diabetes, order a diabetic diet, order an endocrine consult, order a diabetes nurse uh, educator consult um, versus case managed care. Uh, which is really having the diabetes educator systematically come in, have that directive to go ahead and, and make some, some education uh, right on the inpatient ward. And then there was another arm where there was an outpatient setting where the patients were then subsequently randomized, you know, either, either group to whether they would go on to have specialized outpatient uh, diabetes care, which uh, is, is, was done by an endocrinologist. So, so this was a six month study and it was uh, in patients who we knew had diabetes. On average, they have had diabetes for over 10 years. They had a median A1C of 7.5%. So, you know, 
about what you would expect in, in, in patients with 10 years of diabetes, not super optimized, but not horrible. Um, and no significant difference was found on the inpatient side of things. So whether, uh, you know, patients on the, you know, during their hospital stay got the specialized diabetes consult, diabetes educator education session, whether they got that or not, or not did not really impact on their, on their glycemic uh, outcomes at the six month mark. What did make the difference though, was whether they received that follow-up, that post-discharge specialized diabetes um, clinic um, follow-up. And, you know, again, nothing, nothing dramatic was done. This is all based on guideline uh, care. Um, and people who were in that clinic had a significant reduction in their A1C. There were other outcomes that also um, improved, and in particular, you know, risk, other risk factors like blood pressure and, 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 and lipid management uh, were, were also more significantly impacted in, in when, when people were receiving specialized care, you know, as endocrinologists. We don't just deal with diabetes. Often we'll be, you know, the ones who also optimize the statin dose or or start the ACE inhibitor. A lot of patients leave uh, hospital not being on therapies, um, and then often get neglected um, if if nobody check, checks in on that. So so that was sort of the um, the premise of 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 the study and what it showed. Um, obviously, it wasn't a, a very large study. It wasn't power to look at, you know, hard endpoints, but the trend was there and and. That was really enough. And I and I really found that, you know, looking back, it was amazing how we took um, this one little study and launched an entire program. <laughs> so, you know, the feasibility study really demonstrated that it is it is possible. We can do this. We can we can identify patients, we can launch them on a path to have specialized diabetes care. And it doesn't have to be very long and it doesn't have to be resource intensive. Um, so, so based on that, you know, again, lots of, you know, great support from, from cardiology colleagues who, who really pushed and, and helped to, to move this forward, we were able to kind of develop the, the program. And um, so basically we went on to say, okay, you know, the, let's, let's look at, you know, what would it, what it would take to implement, um, you know, the, the, uh, you know, a, a diabetes um, care at the Heart Institute from inpatient transition to outpatient. We did a, a, a one day prevalence study to see, you know, how big of a problem it is and, and, and what the potential impact could be. Um, and then we implemented, you know, the, the inpatient and outpatient uh, uh, in, uh, arms uh, in, in 2011. So this was what I referred to when I said there was that pre-implementation point prevalence survey. Um, and, you know, you can imagine this is pre-diabetes uh, program. So, so what, I, what I circled there is, is how little um, patients were, were um, getting sort of diabetes educator and endocrinology consult on the inpatient. And if you can imagine, if patients uh, weren't getting an inpatient consult, they likely weren't getting an outpatient consult as well. So, so that was the big uh, changing point is really having that that early, um, you know, set on the path of having that diabetes uh, uh, expert um, being involved in that care, and then and then to follow into outpatient. This was the first iteration of the medical directive. We've gone through this several times now. I think we're on you know, version four or five. Um, certainly, you know, it, 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 it's been, you know, a, a, a moving target in terms of what we, we would get feedback in terms of how the medical directive was working or not working, who we were missing, you know, was it too much, was it too little? Um, so so that, was, that was really important. Um, but I wanted to highlight here, you know, something that's never been done <laughs> uh, prior to this, which is that, you know, if someone came in, everybody came into the hospital, had a screening hemoglobin A1C, and just based on that A1C, you can diagnose someone with diabetes if they've never been told they had diabetes before. Um, you know, there are other ways to diagnose diabetes for sure. And A1C can miss some people. Um, and certainly, you know, a lot of people will have changing A1Cs depending on other uh, problems like hemoglobinopathies or anemia and things like that. So so there are there are barriers to using this as a screening tool. However, for the people who are confirmed, they come in, they have an elevated hemoglobin A1C and likely have an elevated random glucose as well. You know, 
once they're given that diagnosis, someone tells that to the patient. And I think that that's really a simple thing, but impactful because when we did, you know, when we early on when we started this this program, I was seeing all of those patients as outpatient. You know, they were they were they were diagnosed with diabetes in hospital. They were referred to me. And the shock and surprise of, uh, uh, in patients, because I've never been told. And then I look back and they've had elevated A1Cs forever. You know, it, 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 is, it is quite, um, you know, um, insightful for me to, to realize that, you know, this is something that people don't often see or feel the need to immediately address. So, so that's been new. And, and what's been worked into this directive has been, you don't have to do anything about it, but you need to tell the patient, you know, there's a sugar problem. It needs to at least be followed. Um, and then we've taken it one step beyond that, where we don't just leave it to the patient or don't just leave it to the attending physician who has a million things to, re, you know, to, to take care of, to, to take care of this additional thing, is we've worked it in so that there is an automatic letter that goes to the family doctor if someone has been diagnosed with diabetes or pre-diabetes even. Um, and then there's some educational material, there's an automatic referral to a community diabetes education program. That has been incredibly impactful. Um, the, the community programs tell us all the time that they they see that. They see, you know, the, the volume of, of people attending their classes increase directly as a result of this particular uh, initiative. Um, in subsequent iterations of this of this um, uh, directive, you know, one thing that we've also done is, you know, in people who you have like an automatic new diagnosis of diabetes, their GFR is fine. They're not, you know, going for a cath. They get put on metformin, you know, so why not? It's a safe first line drug. And why not start it in hospital when someone is there and you can observe? Um, so, so that's been that's been added as well, and and that's been really um, you know more on the on the surgery side of things, the cardiac surgery patients. Um, that's been that's been you know appreciated. A lot of our surgeons have felt that you know that wasn't their place to start metformin, and and and, and having that built in and having that follow up was was uh, was easy, automated, easy. We're watching for it. So this was our program uh, 10 years ago. It was, you know, a two woman show, essentially. There was me, uh, the endocrinologist, um, that was also responsible for sort of helping with the, developing the program and rollout. Um, I saw all the patients in, in the post-discharge diabetes clinic, um, with a caveat, if they already had, you know, a specialist, uh, either an internist or, or an endocrinologist following them, I, I, don't, I don't double dip, I don't see them. They only come to me if they don't have that. Um, there was obviously a choice given to patients, uh, patients at that time, uh, you know, who were particularly travel or out of town, they, they, they may choose not to, not to show up for that appointment, and that's absolutely fine. So it, it worked out to be about 40% of, of, of patients who were unattached, um, uh, diagnosed or managed on the inpatient side. So anybody who got automatic, you know, diabetes nurse educator involvement because their A1C was elevated, they would get referred to the clinic. Anybody with endocrinology consulted as an inpatient, they would get referred to that clinic. Um, and then anybody with a new diagnosis. So it was about 40% of the patients ended up in that clinic and I, and I was seeing them. The volumes were not high. It was manageable at that point, uh, half a day a week. Um, and then we had Kim Twyman, our diabetes nurse edu educator, who's been with us specialist since the very beginning. And, and she saw all the inpatient consults, you know, helped develop all the programs, all the educational programs. She, you know, kind of, uh, you know, gathered a team of supporting nurses around her and uh, has been able to really build on on the nursing side of it incredibly well. Um, and then we had our, our, you know, our cardiology colleagues to really, you know, really support this program as well. So we rolled this out across all units. And then we 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 went and had a go at it. Just to give you an idea, like you know, uh, sort of what numbers we're talking about, you know. So you know, we started just measuring A1Cs on all inpatients across all of the units at the Heart Institute, and you know, in in that first year, you know, there's about about five thousand inpatient visits. We had collect about A1Cs in about almost four thousand patients. Um, and and of those, you know, that that did have that A1C of over 6.5%, 
the mean was about it was about eight percent. Um, and there is, a, I'll, I'll show you sort of the stagger. There is a bit of a, a difference between uh, cardiology and surgery um, in terms of the mean A1Cs on the two floors. But you know, so again, people who have diabetes, A1C over six point five percent. Most of the people who end up in hospital or on average did not have A1Cs that were close to target. You know, we're still aiming for seven percent for for most. And of course, you know, there this is this is under under diagnosing a, a lot of people because of the issues with A1C, as I was mentioning. So I mentioned sort of the new diagnosis population. So, you know, how many people were we picking up and telling them they have diabetes that they didn't know about before? You know, it, of, of the people that we were getting A1Cs over over 6.5%, um, you know, about a quarter, uh, about a fifth, like about 21% uh, were a new diagnosis. Um, so so that's, that's significant, really. I think, you know, to have um, that many uh, patients who, um, didn't even know they had diabetes before. And those with pre-existing um, diabetes, the A1C um, was, was obviously higher than that, um, but you know, definitely tends to be higher in the surgery population. You can see the, the stagger with the surgery population tends to be very, very high A1Cs. Um, it, it just comes down to the patient population. The, these, are, these are patients probably who are living with diabetes for a longer period of time perhaps suboptimal for a longer period of time, which then leads to, to um, their cardiac um, disease. Again, just to give you a snapshot of sort of the, the, um, the volumes that we were dealing with uh, in, initially. So, you know, the, the patients that, you know, we initially were seeing, um, you know, based on A1C, um, you know, were, were increasing over those first few months after, after launching the medical directive. But really made the impact, though, in February of 2012 was when um, the, the medical directive became a, a standard. It became an automatic. It was a requirement. Every patient had to have it. Um, the, the numbers jumped up and the number of referrals um, jumped up as well. And then we, st we start to consistently see higher uh, number of referrals to the inpatient diabetes team and, and to, to the outpatient as well. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit, um, and just again, this is this is a very very over the top, you know, uh, overview of of all the different programs that we've been involved in. So I'm just talk a little bit about cardiac surgery patients and what we've done there. So one of the things that became apparent, you know, a few years into our program was that there was a gap in terms of the perioperative insulin. So we know that um, there was a large proportion of patients who were developing post-operative infections that's tracked very closely by the surgeons. And there's a variety of reasons for that. But certainly for the patients with diabetes, this is a, uh, uh, an evidence-based metric that can be used to say, you know, patients who have suboptimally controlled diabetes around the perioperative period do have a higher risk of, of uh, post-operative infections, and is there a role to, to tighten that up a little bit? And there is, you know, obviously in the literature, lots of lots of you know good data around it, IV insulin therapy or, or, or insulin infusion therapy in the immediate perioperative period. Um, and and you know you know the the classic would be to keep them on IV insulin for seven days. That is not realistically what's happening on, in our in our surgical uh, uh, intensive units. Um, most patients are there for a much shorter period of time, and then, you know, once they're off the IV insulin, then the, you know the the that's where the sugar problems can go up, and that potentially was contributing to to the higher risk of infections, but also length of stay. You know, patients are are running high sugars for a couple of days; it could delay their their discharge. Um, often, it's not realized until they're right before discharge that something needs to be done, and they need to be started on insulin. And so and so, we thought there was a gap there that needed to to be addressed. So so what we did was we developed a little um, uh, uh, protocol to to treat hyperglycemia. To help with that transition period between IV insulin and subcutaneous insulin post uh, uh, coronary uh, artery bypass surgery. So, you know, we we looked at the literature, see what was what was what was uh, what was out there in terms of um, protocols, 
and and there is no standard protocol. A lot of it was based on on weight, you know, just kind of like calculating the weight of a patient and then putting them on insulin. We felt that that was that was really aggressive, and 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 you know we had a. Um, uh, a working group that included uh, cardiac uh, anesthesiologists who really felt that, you know, they wanted something that was safe. They were transitioning them from CSICU to the ward. They did not want to send somebody out on huge doses of sub-Q insulin and then not be able to see what happens to that. So we we erred on the side of safety. And what we did is we developed a protocol that was based on the amount of IV insulin they were requiring in that last couple of hours before they went off the drip. Um, and, 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 and this was really just, to, again, just to really try to you know, err on what the patient's actual requirements are in that relatively stable period when they're ready to leave uh, the intensive unit. Um, and we, we kind of just looked at those average uh, rates within those last uh, four hours and then did a 50% reduction and then put them on sub-Q insulin. Again, a lot of this was meant to be automated. So, you know, um, there is always going to be a physician that's going to be signing off on these, on these orders, but it came in as more of a suggested calculated rate. Um, and, and now with Epic, you know, it's, it can be built in into sort of that suggested as well as a pre, uh, pre, preset order set. Um, but definitely, you know, back in the day when we were doing paper, it was all like a form that, you know, had these suggested calculations that you had to go through and, 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 and then plug in the numbers. So when we looked at sort of the patients that were um, developing uh, infections, you know, it was quite interesting that, you know, the people who were actually developing more uh, infections were people in the lower A1C group. Okay, so this was early on when we, before we implemented the protocol, we wanted to see, you know, what, you know, who were the people that were developing infections? And it might seem counterintuitive, but when, it, when you dug a little bit deeper into the charts, you come to realize that people who come into hospital with A1Cs of eight, less than 8%, they were not aggressively managed, okay? So, you know, they may have gone their perioperative uh, insulin therapy, there's a lot of stress around the, the surgery, and then they get transitioned out on nothing, okay? And these are people who probably just by basis of the cortisol stress response will need insulin for at least a few more days on the ward. And that's sort of my explanation for, for this finding is that, you know, if people who come in with A1Cs of 13%, someone would have consulted somebody, someone would have started that person on insulin. But it's that sort of intermediate group that I think we often will miss the boat on. And, and that was a learning lesson for me. And, and, and really, again, having that automated real time, let's not just look at A1C, let's look at what their recurrent requirements are to base our treatment decisions. Um, so this is pretty much... Um, you know, again, just telling us that a lot of people had high A1Cs when they come into hospital for, for cardiac surgery. Um, and, the, and then the blood glucose data over the 72 hours after they, they leave CSICU. So, you know, they, 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 they tend to have, you know, most of the blood sugars in the five to 10 range, which is, which is what we want. So this is post transition off to, 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 to insulin, uh, to sub-Q insulin. And, and really we want to really target these ones who are still quite high after that 72 hours when they're off of, of the, uh, the IV insulin. This is an example of, of uh, again, the first iteration of the, of the, of the protocol that we developed. Um, you know, with, uh, with all of these sort of um, uh, strategies and, and protocols, it, it always is a balance of not trying to make things too complicated, um, but at the same time, you want to make it individualized and specific for the patient. I've learned a lot uh, developing these. And again, you know, um, the, the important thing is always to go back, revisit, revise, look at rates of hypoglycemia, look at how many people were, were not adequately controlled, and then and revisiting that process. So, um, um, these these things these cycles can happen pretty quickly um, if you have the manpower and resources for people to kind of go back and review uh, post implementation data. So you know we we did look at sort of a one year follow up and and people who actually transition from IV insulin to, to sub Q insulin. And the data was was quite good. So I mean, we we saw that you know people who again not not large numbers. You know, this was it was 
voluntary, you know, which physicians wanted to, to implement the protocol at that time. And, you know, the, the, the A1Cs are there. We saw that, you know, the, the mean sub-Q insulin dose was 0.3 units per kilo. So not, not really, uh, um, you know, uh, 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 a very low dose, okay? Um, so you can imagine, you know, when we talk about in the outpatient world, starting someone on insulin, we're usually starting at 0.1 units per kilo. So this is, this is the amount, again, that stress response post-op usually means more insulin. Um, and then we looked at sort of, you know, their, their blood sugar data, um, at different, um, you know, different set points. And really, we wanted to focus on hypoglycemia. And so again, this is this is one set of iteration that we went through and just really looked at, you know, are we are we causing excessive hypoglycemia? When do we put that stop point uh, uh, of that sub Q insulin? And, and based on this data, we decided that, you know, we should probably, um, you know, order that sub-Q insulin not beyond three days for sure. Um, and, and really, you know, just really have a reassessment at that point, because again, you expect the, the blood sugars to fall. Uh, this is another way of looking at it. So really just, you know, the, the different um, time points of the 24 hour, 48 hour, 72 hours. Um, this was important because the patients were are on the ward at this point. They were they were not, you know, in that intensive unit being monitored with with you know high ratio of nurses. So so really having something in place where we were capturing uh, potential dangers and low blood sugars was was important. Another little program that we did with cardiac surgery was was this prehab program. Um, it was a very small pilot, but it was it was nice. It was, I presented this at ADA uh, a couple of years ago. Um, it, it really you know addressed that patient population where they were you know awaiting elective surgery. They were told that they weren't you know supposed to do too much in terms of exercise, but they have a strong desire to to really optimize their risk and, and health prior to surgery because we know that improves outcomes. Um, so, so diabetes um, uh, was part of that. And, and, and uh, we identified with, with you know, the, 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 the prehab group, you know, the patients who had diabetes, who wanted to optimize their diabetes before surgery, and really just went over sort of very basic diabetes education, uh, optimization strategies, including nutrition, exercise to a limited degree, and optimizing medications, um, and, and then really involving the diabetes team where people needed that help to get their, their blood sugars better to target before surgery. Um, and, and so sometimes they may involve a referral to the, to, the, to, the, to the clinic. So this was the one sort of uh, early initiative that I deviated away from just seeing people post-discharge. I saw them before admission to try to optimize their care before surgery. Um, and then really also getting the diabetes nurse educator involved early, even you know, prior to admission to, to, to get that educational piece in. And, and we did see, you know, in the prehab group that, you know, there was a demonstrated drop in A1C. Again, the, the, the timelines are so short, right? Like sometimes people are only waiting for a few weeks. So A1C is not going to change all that much. But there was a, a change in A1C. There was definitely, you know, uh, patient satisfaction in the small group that, 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 we, that we surveyed that, you know, that this was quite helpful for them. Shifting gears again to another kind of neat little uh, uh, program that uh, that we wrote a paper on. This is uh, the pre-diabetes group. Um, so pre-diabetes, um, as I mentioned earlier, we were picking up a lot of patients with pre-diabetes because we were using A1C as a screen tool. So if the A1C came in between 6 to 6.4, they have pre-diabetes. What do we do with that? The guidelines at that time did not say to use any medical therapy. It just says lifestyle, 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 education. You know, patients were in hospital with a cardiac event. What was our role? What was our goal with this patient population? And, and I have to credit, you know, Kim and her team because, you know, really, you know, without having a lot of medical input, you know, it's the education piece that was, that was definitely um, implemented and then follow up into the community with those education classes with a letter to the family doctor saying this person has uh, pre-diabetes at minimum scream them again you know like so so that would be you know something that is is guideline based but surprisingly gets missed quite a bit you know people people don't leave hospital with a discharge summary item diagnosis diabetes 
you know, it may not get addressed uh, in the future. And anecdotally, we were noticing these recurrent admissions, people who were, you know, pre-diabetic on uh, one admission, at the next admission, they were now full on diabetes and nothing, they're, they're on, they, nothing has been addressed, nothing's been done. So we felt that that was something that we need to look at a little bit more closely. Um, so we evaluated sort of all the patients with that pre-diabetes, that met that pre-diabetes criteria over the course of a year. Um, and, you know, it was about 230 patients. And then we compare that to a comparator group with, you know, age match, sex match, uh, diagnosis match with no diabetes. And we wanted to see sort of if there was a change in sort of the, uh, the readmission uh, incidence for uh, ACS over a five year period. So the good news is that, you know, over that short period of time, the patients uh, who presented with ACS pre-diabetes wasn't associated with an increased risk of, of readmission. Surprising? Probably not. Five years is not that long of a time. But what I really think happened here is, again, our, our strategies were already in place to have that education piece, that lifestyle piece, which we know prevents diabetes, okay? So having people embark on a lifestyle program at the pre-diabetes stage will prevent diabetes. This is proven by a diabetes prevention program. Um, and, you know, it's going to be better than any medication we ever prescribe them. So perhaps by having that strategy of preventing diabetes, we actually also mitigated some of the risk of developing that subsequent uh, coronary, uh, coronary syndrome. There's limitations, obviously. We can only look at one institution. I don't know what happened to people outside of our, our Ottawa area. Um, so so, th so that, that, is a, that is a limitation of the study. But, but I thought that was really um, important for us to know that we were at least doing okay, that having that education piece was perhaps at least good enough for now. Um, and certainly as guidelines change and, and perhaps starting metformin might be another add-on safe thing to do that will also continue to mitigate that risk. So I'm going to shift gears to my final little sort of area that I'm going to talk about, um, you know, which is sort of some of the newer inpatient diabetes management strategies. And here I'm really referring to sort of the shift in the in the paradigm and management of type 2 diabetes. We've moved, at least for, uh, for high-risk patients with cardiac or renal disease, we moved away from just looking purely at A1C, which is what we've been doing initially, um, to looking at A1C plus considering you know, these comorbidities and risk factors and, and what therapies might help to, to mitigate uh, those, those conditions. Um, so these are the A, B, C, D, E, S of diabetes care. And you can see here, you have your A1C, your blood pressure, your cholesterol, and then the drugs for CVD and risk reduction. So, so SGLT2 and GLP1 have demonstrated cardiovascular benefits. So, so that has factored into not just our diabetes management in general, but for this population, it has factored into should we be starting these early in hospital because you know, they, they have proven benefit in a very, in a very short time period. So, you know, I don't have to tell, tell this group, you know, sort of the evolution of, of, the, of the SGLT2 story. Um, but certainly, you know, all of this was happening at the time that, you know, we're making all of these developments in, in diabetes um, protocols at the Heart Institute. Um, and here I would have to thank, you know, uh, Dr. Ross Davies, who, who really has pioneered sort of pushing through having uh, the SGLT2s on formulary. Um, he uh, had invited me to, to, to help him sort of write, you know, a lot of letters to, to, to the hospital and, and try to get, get the medications on the formulary with the, the evidence suggesting that there's benefit. And, you know, all of this evidence is, is abundant, and, and, and I, I'm not going to go over this today. I, I've gone over this in, in other talks before, but certainly this all shows that, you know, in the cardiac population, um, the benefits are huge and early. Um, so along with, you know, starting, you know, great, we got, we got the medication on formulary, we're starting these medications in hospital on patients, what is the risk? And, you know, in the studies, the risk of DKA is quite low, okay, but clinically we see it, okay, and when we see people come in now on SGLT2s, 
And because it's an urgent admission not stopping it, they developed EK in hospital. So, so that became a concern. And, and, and certainly, you know, I was invited to, to more and more m and rounds at various divisions because they were seeing this and, and they wanted to, to really find out, you know, should we just take these drugs off formulary? Should we, you know, do be doing something more to educate, you know, uh, pharmacists and, and, and residents and admitting staff about what to do with these medications? So why do SGLT2s cause a DKA? Well, they do it because they, they promote acidosis, they pr promote ketone production, they promote lipolysis, um, and, and they do um, promote ketone production at the liver. And certainly in a fasting state, that, that is exacerbated. So fasting, number one, you know, is already a, you know, a, a, a reason to not take the medication. Stress, which increases, you know, the counter-regulatory hormones effect on the liver, which then along with the SGLT2, which can, you know, um, not allow, uh, you know, bicarb retention, will, will promote more acidosis as well. So those, so those situations are why we're, we potentially are seeing it more and, and, and in a, in a non-study population where it's not controlled, where people are not monitoring for, for these things as well. We do have evidence that patients can start it safely in hospital. So, you know, soloists and, and impulse were, were patients who were admitted in hospital with CHF uh, on diuretics and started on SGLT2s and did well. Um, so, so that was the, the, the goal is to be able to kind of emulate those study you know, parameters, those study outcomes without the increased risk. So we did this retrospective analysis at TOH and UOHI uh, over the past two years, and we looked at all the patients who were uh, either started on or continued on an SGLT2 uh, during their admission. Um, we looked at sort of not just diagnosed DKA, but having metabolic parameters that suggest that they have DKA without ever being formally diagnosed. So we kind of went through and looked at all of the labs uh, that showed a high anion gap and low bicarb. Um, obviously, we excluded uh, people who who were um, not admitted, who were who did not have a diagnosis of diabetes. We didn't want to get into you know um, non-indicated use of SGLT2 at that time. Um, so what we did is we pulled all of these charts and we looked at the metabolic parameters, we reviewed it, um, and then we looked at, you know, dividing the cohorts into how, what were the, 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 uh, the rates and characteristics like before the, uh, the, the medications were on formulary versus post-formulary, so six months uh, in each group. And this is why I wanted to bring it up with this group is that there were zero <laughs> SGLT2 associated DKA before the medications were on formulary. Post formulary, you had you know a significant number um, of SGLT2 associated ketoacidosis, not as high as as the other campuses for sure, but this is a volume thing. Um, so so with increased use, we are seeing increased adverse effects, and that bears in mind we need to dig deeper. So this this project is still ongoing. You know, I have a, an amazing resident that's working on it as well. So so hopefully we'll be able to basically dig a little bit deeper into, into the, the, the cases um, at the Heart Institute, and I'll be able to, to use that to, to feed back. What we know um, so far, you know, is, is, you know, what the patient, which, which service they were admitted to. We know that, you know, having an admission diagnosis of infection greatly increases the risk of, of DKA. So that's something that, you know, I'm going to put a plug in there right now is, you know, really be cautious if someone was admitted with infection. Um, and certainly, you know, some of the issues that may happen during, during the admission that also may be high risk factors would be like developing an AKI. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I have shared and I will be happy to share again, um, you know, the, the guidelines that I co-authored on, on safe use in inpatients for, for SGLT2 inhibitors um, and really having an, a, a fluctuating creatinine or fluctuating renal function um, is not a good idea to, to the population to be using this in. 
So the key points for this particular study so far, which is ongoing, uh, we're presenting some early data at uh, Diabetes Canada in November, um, is that you know there are significant benefits with 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 these therapies. And even though the trials show low incidence of, of DKA, um, we, we're seeing that clinically um, uh, in a practical real world setting and that, you know, there are some associated uh, patient characteristics that I, uh, that I think we should be cautious of, infection, acute kidney injury, decreased oral intake, or planned procedure or surgery. Those are all red flags. Um, we already, you know, have, you know, put out the message, you know, stop these medications three to five days before any planned surgery, but oftentimes surgery is not that, that planned. So, so that could be a barrier. Um, and patients need to be educated on sick day management. Physicians need to be educated to, to actually make the diagnosis. So, you know, uh, I didn't present the data, but we picked up so many of these subtle mild DKAs that were never labeled as DKA. Um, so that's something to, to, to also uh, educate our physicians on. So where are we at now in 2022? Well, you know, I think our program has expanded. Okay, so you know, we still we still have our, our 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 two women show plus. Okay, so so a diabetes nurse uh, specialist. We have additional help. Um, I'm going to get Kim to talk about that in a little bit. Um, so certainly the the volumes of 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 consults to diabetes nurse specialist in hospital has gone up. I must say that this is a very unique thing uh, in, in Ottawa and across uh, the country from, from what I've heard from colleagues is really having a very active inpatient diabetes nurse educator um, uh, role. I think that that needs to be protected. I think we need to encourage it. There is so much work and so much of it is done by, by the nurse specialist that, that, that it really would be impossible to run a program like this without having dedicated nursing and specialized nursing to 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 really address all the things that need to be addressed so we're you know ranging from like up to 100 consults to the nurse educators per month and and that's a huge jump from those early days that i showed you earlier from a clinic point of view you know i'm we're only open to patients who are followed by physicians at the uohi Occasionally, some from the general uh, will refer, and of course, you know, uh, we accept them. Um, for, but we wanted to focus on that immediately discharged patient population. They perhaps were started on a therapy. You know, we want to we want the admitting physicians to feel comfortable that if they started someone on an SGLT, to started someone on insulin, started someone on metformin, that there is backup there. You know, in 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 this day and age, you know, that's very. Um, unpredictable what the what the primary care situation is. So having that immediate follow up six to eight weeks uh, was is, is a mandate that I, I really want to keep. Um, and you know have a clinic running a one full day uh, per week. Our total consults per month is anywhere from thirty to forty. We have a high volume of virtual visits over the past two years. I'm very i um, grateful that we had that opportunity. Certainly regionally, the Heart Institute does have a lot of patients who are not from within the, the immediate Ottawa area. It's been, a, it's been huge to be able to offer this to, to patients who just left hospital but may not be able to or want to come back immediately. I think that that's, that's an area that really needs to be worked on. I know we all are struggling with, with the transition back to in-persons and, and, and the restrictions that come with that. But um, but this is this is a, an area that I think there's definitely role for more um, development and more uh, resources put into. I'm going to just summarize really quickly in the last two minutes the lessons learned. So comprehensive diabetes care in a tertiary care cardiac institution is achievable and it's effective. Um, and I do think that as with any sort of QI program, it cannot be all automated. It cannot all be individualized. It needs to be a hybrid of both. And I think we've done that very, very well. And that's the key to our success is that you have some automated features to lessen the burden on admitting physicians, but then you also have that individualized component. Um, and as with any new uh, program, we need to evaluate for safety and efficacy. I've showed you some data of, of us starting to do that a little bit. It is very uh, time consuming and resource intensive, but I think it's important. You know, we can't start new things and not look at whether they're effective or, or safe for our patients. 
collaboration is key. I couldn't do this without all the support of, of, of all of you. And, and I'm very eager to hear of more people who want to collaborate and, and help and, and ideas. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm now a squatter. So definitely, you know, um, I, want, I want to be engaged and engage all of you uh, in our program. Um, further areas to explore, we're already starting to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, prediabetes, obesity, nutrition, all things that, you know, we, we share in common in terms of, of areas that affect our patients. And, and certainly I hope to, to further expand into those areas. So this picture was taken of Kim and I, like just I think a year or two into our program. As you can see, we're just a couple of teenagers who are very keen and very happy to be here. Um, you know, was featured in the newsletter at the, the Heart Institute. Um, now, 10 years later, we're no longer teenagers, um, but we're still very happy to be here. Um, so our founding supporters, I want to really thank again, Dr. Davies, uh, Dr. Mark Rural, Dr. Beanlands. It was, was, it was a hugely supportive uh, uh, in, in, in the launch. Uh, ongoing support, Dr. Bernie, Dr. Liu, Dr. Ross Davies, uh, Lloyd, Lisa, all of you are, are, are been really great champions for our for our for our program. Uh, we have uh, an amazing supporting staff of, of, of clinic and inpatient nurses, um, collaboration with the rehab program. Um, so thank you very much. And uh, I am open to questions.